So this webinar is going to teach you the truth about um, these areas. And I guarantee at the end of the hour, you'll feel differently about your money than you do now. So we'll review what are now the 10 must answer questions. What does risk mean and why should you care about it? Uh, what is a safe withdrawal rate to take from your assets for income? How should they be allocated for retirement? How do you plan for taxes in retirement? Uh, if we do well on these, uh, you'll probably leave my money behind. What's the best way to do that? Aside from the mythology, what have actual stock market returns been? What are you paying in total fees? What are the seven rules for retirement security? And this isn't defined just as financial security. It's for a feeling of security, the feeling of security in retirement. Uh, what are the best ways to create guaranteed lifetime income? Uh, the importance of a written plan and how to stop worrying about your money. Uh, and that's the seven rules. So this was called the million dollar webinar, which didn't say much about what it's about. So I changed it to how to survive and thrive in retirement. So uh, COVID changed a lot of things and I'm hoping that whole mess is over with and everybody survived, but you still have a right to thrive in retirement. This isn't all about just survival doesn't mean giving up your hopes and dreams, but it is essential to protect what you've got. So who are we and what do we do? Well, we work uh, exclusively with uh, retirees and pre-retirees, uh, Amanda and I. Uh, behind us, we have a national support team. We have people in St. Louis, you know, down in uh, Sacramento, all over the country that we feel are expert in their particular areas. Because one, one or two people can't possibly keep up on everything. So with that team, we build customized written income plans uh, with cloud access uh, through a client portal. Uh, we use a bunch of different uh, strategies for asset protection and growth. We calculate how best to generate lifetime income because that's the number one worry of seniors. We seek not even competitive returns, just returns adequate to make your plan work without excessive risk. We show you how much you're paying in fees and how to reduce them. And again, if we're successful with those tasks, you're going to be leaving money behind. And how should you do that? Uh, we believe in full transparency and putting everything, all the details in writing. And typically our clients have a million to 20 million of assets. Our current minimum uh, is 450. So that's me. I think you've all seen this before if you've been in a, a prior class. Uh, the key is I've been around a long time. I've had uh, the most prestigious credential for 25 years that requires annual uh, minimum continuing ed classes. Uh, a year ago last summer, I had the good fortune to hire Amanda. Uh, her goal is to be a pair planner with me, and I think she'll be a great one, probably better than I am. She's got a very valuable degree from Washington State U, um, was a marketing specialist for UPS, and she actually loves her job, I think. Don't want to put words in your mouth, Amanda. <laughs> So this class is based on 
This 500 page book by Dan Ahmad, Jim Files, and Jack Canfield of the, the Chicken Soup fame. And an eight hour series of classes that uh, they developed. So you're getting 500 pages and eight hours in one hour during lunch. So Dan and Jim developed this beautiful coffee table book and I've taken some pages out of it. And what I like about it is these are what real people think and feel about what financial freedom is. So financial freedom is about having the confidence to keep taking trips of a lifetime over and over and over again, if that's your thing. Financial freedom is about not losing what we work so hard for, protecting and growing what we have. Financial freedom means not ever being stressed out because we are told we have to ride out large stock market losses or believe that the market always recovers because we'll never put ourselves in that position again. And this one is pretty universal, whether you have $500 or 5 million, <clears throat> everyone seems to feel this way, that financial freedom means silencing my deepest and loudest fear that I will be poor one day, knowing without reservation that I will always be secure and I have nothing to worry about. And it's nice to be able to feel that way, not just emotionally, but based on facts. And some <laughs> people with kids feel this way, that we've sacrificed a lot over the years. If we don't spend money, our kids sure will. So you're probably here because you worry somewhat about your money or some, something related to it. Uh, retired, soon to be tired, soon to be retired, you're not making money, uh, not saving anymore, you're afraid of losing. Uh, you need income from your assets and you know time is not on your side. You know that the game has changed. Most of the rules are flipped on their head when you enter retirement. Time is your enemy, volatility is your enemy. Uh, unlike when you're saving, when dollar cost averaging into a volatile market actually helps you. So we call these two phases accumulation and decumulation. And here are the 10 questions that uh, you must be able to answer. And virtually everybody I meet with can answer only one, if any. I suspect most can't answer any of them. How much can you safely withdraw? Well, in my industry, that number is all over the map. Who do you believe? If I do take out this much money, how long will it last? Can I guarantee I won't run out of money? Can I protect my assets from losses? How much tax will I pay? How much will the next crash cost me? Is fee reduction possible? Is it okay to spend some of my money right now? Um, what if I or my spouse pass away prematurely? Uh, can I leave money to my beneficiaries? And more importantly, what's the best way to do that? So if you can't answer these 10 questions, then your plan is, if you have one, is probably based on hope and luck. So it's your money, it's time that you got answers to these questions, uh, answers that are true. Now I read a lot <clears throat> and subscribe to a lot of newsletters um, and not all of them are about money. Uh, Shankman Law, Interactive Legal uh, are about estate planning. Uh, yes Magazine is a Fascinating uh, progressive publication about local micro solutions to our problems. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I read about Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, Daily Coast is a progressive publication and so on. So if I see a, a theme running through all of these, then I suspect that there may be some truth behind it. And I have time to do this before breakfast because I'm not under the pressure of a broker dealer to make my 100 calls today. So this slide frames the rest of the presentation. Uh, this should make your head explode if it hasn't before. So this is Yahoo Finance, June 8th, uh, just about the end of the rebound from the March uh, correction. But the economy was, was officially in a recession. So how is it that the stock market can be booming and yet uh, the actual real people are in a recession? And I think this just displays the psychosis of our economy uh, versus the market uh, perfectly. So let's see what I call the big brains uh, think about this. So here's Vanguard, end of last month, or I mean end of July. These are their 10 year annualized return forecast. You'll notice the biggest number anywhere here is 7.2% for uh, non US stocks. Uh, U.S. stocks, 2.4 to 4.4. I don't know what uh, you have heard as far as what to expect with market returns, but for people that do have plans, I routinely see projections of 8 to 10% because uh, the mythology is that's what it's been historically, and nothing's different this time. Karen DeMasters in Financial Advisor Magazine interviewed Rick Edelman, who manages a large uh, hedge fund. Um, clients need to realize that markets could get worse instead of better over the next year. And so here we are, and they haven't gotten worse yet. Uh, one key indicator is commercial vacancy rates have held steady at about 16 to 17%. And prior to the crisis in March, we, Americans were already 3.7% <clears throat> trillion short in retirement savings that they'll need. Evan Simonoff in Financial Advisor. Uh, Rob Arnott. Uh, research affiliates feels that the standard 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio will earn somewhere between zero and 1% over the next 10 years. So quite a bit more cynical than Vanguard. Gary Schilling, uh, famous, brilliant economist, uh, is warning the stock market is posed for a 40% drop. And he thinks, and he's fairly conservative, he thinks that the climate feels like it did in 1929. Sean Langlois, little dramatic, a shocking, spectacular, and disorderly market crash looms. So even though the Fed is pulling back on its asset purchases, uh, we have this 3.5 trillion stimulus bill that might pass. Will that help? How long will that extend the party? But here's a key st uh, stat from Bloomberg data. Uh, currently 530 out of 8,500 stocks trade at more than 10 times sales. And there's only once in history that we've seen a larger percentage. And that was March of 2000. Uh, right before the tech bubble. You've probably heard of Fang, uh, Facebook, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, um, Netflix, Google. Uh, now it's Phantom because uh, Google was acquired by Alphabet, but still this is six companies that have driven most of the growth in the S&P 500 since 2008. 
Uh, does anybody think it's a good idea for six companies to be driving the market? Especially since Congress is making noises about uh, enforcing restraint of trade and monopoly laws. Wayne Dugan, Yahoo Finance. Uh, the CAPE ratio is a simple measure of earnings and uh, Robert Schiller developed it. It's the share price divided by 10 year average inflation adjusted earnings. Uh, if that means anything to you. But stocks have only been this expensive one other time, and that's at the height of the dot com bubble in 2000. Sean Langua again. Carl Icahn, brilliant uh, hedge fund manager. Uh, is building up his dike against uh, the flood of a uh, correction. Michael Thrasher, RIA -R -I Intel, that's registered investment advisor Intel, which is what I am. 47% uh, of investors believe the management costs of investments are included in their advisor's fee. Uh, but the true cost can be three, four times that. And that really erodes earnings. Wall Street Journal, Neil Templin. There's a strong case in you know, tested portfolios to replace some bonds with annuities. Uh, the reason is that bonds are typically an income play, but if interest rates rise, it decimates bond values. Uh, that's not the case with annuities. What you have is what you have. Uh, Wade Fow of the American College and Boston College of Retirement Studies has tested thousands of portfolios and thinks the ideal and most efficient portfolio involves uh, stocks for growth and uh, dependable, in dependable income from annuities. Dow Jones market data. The uh, correction last year was not normal. The average peak to recovery uh, <clears throat> through March of 2020 is four and a half, four and a half months. No, I'm sorry, the uh, recovery took four and a half months from March, 140 days. The average is four and a half years. Prior to 2020, the shortest peak to recovery was 10 months. So a very weird year last year. So enough depressing news. The point is that things are different now and not for the better. And it's fairly easy to, uh, to plan for it. So, you each probably have a beautiful pie chart in your statement. Uh, you've probably been told you're diversified. A lot of these I see have so much overlap that um, they're just holding the same thing 20 different ways. You've probably been told that diversification minimizes risk, which isn't necessarily the case. Uh, you may have been told mutual funds are safer than stocks that you won't lose a lot, that you'll earn good rates of return, and that it'll provide a high level of income you can depend on. And last, that you're paying only 1% in fees. So what if a lot of that isn't true? Well, you still have the beautiful pie chart. You know, look on the bright side. So the green, this green, uh, graph shows the S&P 500 index <clears throat> from 2000 to this year. And remember I mentioned the myth of a 10% plus return. What was the return between 2000 and December 31st, 2020? 4.58%. Uh, 
And that's before fees, before taxes, and before inflation. Well, how could that be? Well, from 2000 to 2002, you lost 50%. Uh, what you remember is the recovery, 100%, and then promptly lost 50,000 again, or 50% again, and it took several years to recover. So it took 13 years to break even before taxes and before fees and before inflation. If you're planning to retire this year or next year, can you afford to have negative effect, effective negative return for the next 13 years? Probably not. So if you would like an assessment of the risk and volatility in your portfolio, simply type risk in the chat box and we will set up a special uh, meeting for you. And I have to ask the question, what do you think is going to happen from here? What if it didn't matter what you thought would happen if you were prepared? So is this really how you want your money to behave in retirement? So from January 99 to uh, you know, 15 years later, average return 2.75 before fees. So 0% return, 13 years. And how could that be? Well, uh, SP 500 went up 19.5% that period, uh, lost 46%. And then the yen lost 53% in 2008. So instead of an assumed rate of 12%, what if you were taking income and your annual, annualized return is only 4.73%? You've probably heard of Ken Fisher. I know I'm not supposed to denigrate other advisors here, but uh, if you look at his website, uh, they assume about 11% uh, returns going forward. There's really no basis for that kind of projection. So bear markets, everyone know what a bear market is? It's um, 20% or a greater decline that extends for more than a quarter. So since 1929, we've had 16 bear markets, uh, one every five years. On average, they last one and a half years. Five year recovery. So each one delivers six and a half years of an average gain of 0%. So in that scenario, we're depending a lot on the peaks to make this work for us. So if we include the uh, Great Depression, the average loss is 39%. If we take that out, it's about 35. And why should we care other than how stressful that is? Well, I'm gonna give you something that you really need to think about and that I don't see discussed uh, by my peers adequately. And that is the heading of this slide. Losses are very hard to recover. So if you experience just the average correction, well, let's just say 42%, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, 30% uh, and you have a million dollars, that takes you down to 700,000, uh, it will require a 42% return to get back to even. A 53% correction or greater like we had in 2008, 100% return to get back to even. The odds of you 
and join that in a five-year period are very slim. So we've adopted the golden rule of five to 10% that we want to limit losses or maximum drawdown in any given year to 10% or less, preferably five, which is where 90% of my clients are. So if you have a million dollars and you're down 50%, it only takes 5.3% to recover. So here's the primary way that I have a difference of opinion with my industry. Here are the traditional definitions of financial risk and where the risk questionnaires place you. So ultra conservative is considered um, a loss tolerance up to 19%. We're out of a million bucks, 190,000 decline would not bother you. Conservative, uh, 40, 60 stock bond portfolio, up to a 29% loss, moderate, up to a 39% loss. And this is where most portfolios are that I see. It's this classic 60-40 uh, stock bond portfolio. Uh, aggressive, up to a 49% loss, and speculative, uh, 50 to 100% loss. I, on the other hand, view ultra-conservative as 3% or less, conservative less than 6%, and moderate 8% uh, or less, aggressive around 10%. And if you're speculative, if you think, or if you say to me, you don't mind losing a half million, or if you're seeking 12% returns, then we probably aren't a good fit. So what's worse than a stock market loss? High fees. Well, why would that be? Well, stock market loss, you at least have uh, some hope of recovery. With high fees, they're gone. And I recently researched these. The uh, typical advisor fee is 1%. Uh, underneath that, the money manager gets their 1% fee, the average mutual fund fee is a half to 1%. The average trading costs within the fund, 1.44%. Uh, uh, average cash drag, 0.15%, it's not a big deal. But Schwab is notable for this because they have a, a pretty hefty cash requirement to get their low fee portfolios. So total costs, fees, and expenses can meet or exceed 4.5%. Well, what does that mean in real numbers to you? Well, here are the S&P 500 returns from 1999 to 2013. <clears throat> With zero fees, you would accumulate one and a half million. 1% uh, fees, 1.2 million, close to 1.3. 2% uh, fees, um, 1.1 million, 3% fees, 952,000, 4% fees, 815,000. Five percent fee, six hundred and ninety-six thousand. You've shrunk. So here are the total cost of those fees from two hundred ten thousand to eight hundred and six thousand, and as a percent of your original portfolio, twenty-one percent to eighty-one percent. Uh, this is an old article, but this is still the case. Uh, the stated advisory fees and fund fees uh, with these brokerages can be as high as three and a half percent. And I would raise this Harris poll number to 100% of Americans don't know their fees, not their total fees. Another issue is what is a safe withdrawal rate? Well, back in the 80s, if you had a million bucks, 
uh, we were told we could take 60,000 out a year per year, increase that with inflation and our money would last for 30 years. This has gradually declined over the years until now. Um, Wade Fowle of Boston College and American College is saying a safe withdrawal rate is between one and a half to two and a half percent. Well, if your budget is 50,000 and that's what you're used to living on, unless you're a high earner, how are you going to accumulate the two million necessary to meet that budget? So let's look at an example here. Here's 20 years of the S&P 500 actual returns. So you start with a million. We're gonna take 50,000 a year out. And we're not doing any inflation adjusting here. We have 1% annual fee in this column, 2% in this fee. I mean, hit this column and some total. So less than uh, the average fee, uh, you're zeroed out in 12 years at that rate. So wouldn't it be nice to stop worrying about your money? Well, we've developed these seven golden rules to live by for retirement security. And again, not just security on paper, but uh, the feeling of security. Number one, avoid large losses. Even if you can recover, they are stressful. Minimize fees. You would probably rather spend that money yourself. Reduce volatility. Again, the game is flipped on its head from when you're accumulating, where volatility helps you. Um, when you're spending, it kills you. Uh, earn and expect a reasonable rate of return, sufficient to make your plan work. Manage taxes. Don't pay more than you have to pay. Generate certain income. And this number six is the primary factor in retirement contentment. Uh, being assured that you'll be able to meet your budget uh, for as long as you live. And seven, have a written retirement income plan that's easily accessible and makes sense. Uh, it's an important point of reference. So if you did all these things, would you be a success? Well, it's not guaranteed, but the odds are substantially increased. So I have one slide on taxes. I'm not going to belabor that. And it's to show you that they may not be as bad as you think. So here's a uh, Couple, 200,000 of gross income, they're in the 24% bracket, so they're expecting to pay 48,000 in taxes. Well, here's the real story. We have tax brackets. So your taxes are phased in based on each step in income. So let's say of your 200,000, 167 is taxable. Uh, you know, part of it is social security, uh, part of which is not taxable, you know, and then minus your standard deductions. So that alone puts you in the 22% marginal bracket, but let's start at the bottom. So your first 19.9 is taxed 10%. The next 61 at 12, uh, the next 86, 22. So zero income of this couple is taxed at 24%. Uh, their total turns out to be 28 or 20,000 less than they were expecting. 
but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work to get that down in, in addition. So as a percent of their gross, it's 14% and not 28%, half as much. So our task is to control your assets and make them act the way you want to act. And to do that, we use this bucket system. So we have liquid assets. These are easily accessible with no fees or costs and preferably no taxes. Uh, we have growth assets because we want you to remain in the market to capitalize on the hard work and ingenuity of the American economy. And that's in the form of stock, uh, mutual funds, uh, in my case, preferably ETFs, but potentially real estate or having a business. And then principal protection and lifetime income. And most advisors won't tell you this because it's a hassle to be properly licensed. Uh, these products don't pay as well over the long term. And they're usually more concerned about accumulating assets under management to get that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the annual fees from your assets. So generally these are low or no fees, uh, no load, no commissions are taken from your money, unlike the uh, assets under management. Uh, primarily they're fixed indexed annuities uh, with an income rider and that's important. So I have a question for you. I won't take answers, but I know what you're thinking. Let's say I and my dad He's, he's long passed away, but let's suppose we go to the annuity company and take out the same annuity. Is my income going to be different than his? Yes, because he'll be getting longevity credit, uh, credits and also participating in a risk pool. And the older you are, the older the pool and the higher the payouts. If we both walked into a bank to buy a CD, would we get the same rate? Yes, we would. If we bought a stock or a mutual fund, would we get the same returns? Yes, we would. So it's the only financial vehicle that gives you credit for being older. Super important for lifetime income. And there can be a fourth bucket for estate planning and, and so on. But so how do we position your assets here? Well, usually it looks like this, except not with uh, evenly split, split uh, pieces of the pie. And I should tell you, this slide alone was one of the eight classes, so I'll, I'll rush through it. So three steps. Determine how much income you need for life, which requires that you do a budget and also take a longevity calculator because we need to know how much money you need and for how long. Uh, how much liquidity do you need? And I generally recommend more than um, most folks because it's very empowering and freeing to have enough cash to do things that you want to do, whether it's a new car, uh, putting money down on a rental, taking a trip that you got a good deal on. Uh, super important, you know, gifting. And third, how much growth do you want? And this is so you don't feel like you're missing out. So the uh, principal protected lifetime income assets, that's important that... Uh, you're independent from the market, but you want indexing in there to capture uh, some gains in the market. So growth potential without risk, uh, low or no fees and potential income increases. And last but not least, the guaranteed income for life. 
and that uh, requires annuities. Now, why do so many of the financial celebrities demonize annuities? Well, it's because they're thinking of uh, variable annuities, uh, which have fees and commissions associated with them. They can lose money. So they have kind of conflated index annuities with variable annuities, mistakenly. So for liquid money, uh, bank accounts, credit unions, money markets, T-bills, and even some mutual funds like uh, strategic income funds or government income funds are pretty safe. Uh, what about for growth? Well, we want low costs. Uh, zero costs aren't a goal because sometimes you get something in exchange I like to use risk managed uh, portfolios. Um, momentum based portfolios are very popular and I'll explain how those work in a minute. Uh, the key is to stop large losses by either using a stop loss program, you know, buffers or floors. And they're system driven. They don't depend on some superstar advisor that could retire next year. Uh, real estate is a great option if you're inclined to be a landlord and have the propensity for that. Great way for inflation-adjusted, tax-advantaged uh, income. And some folks like to manage assets. I have no problem with that. Uh, we'll help you do it for free. So step one is the guaranteed income. And let's take a, a look here, just a generic look at uh, index annuities, how they work. So here again is the S&P 500 um, table of returns for 20 years. Those are the negative years. If you had a million to start at the end of the period, you'd have two and a half million over that 20 year period. The uh, lowest point was 1.6 million. So what comes with this series of returns? You know, that's not bad. That's a good rate of return, but it can be stressful. So over here, we have the same amount into an indexed annuity with a 0% floor. So no matter what happens in the market, zero is the worst you can get, and then a 6% cap. And some of these have monthly caps. Uh, there's one today, it's got a 2% per month cap. So do the math, you, you can see what the upside potential of that is in a given year. So as you can see in the positive years, you get 6% or whatever the actual return is, whichever is less. And then a bunch of zero years. So worst case, effectively, in the same time period, 2.1 million versus 1.6. So that's just the basic indexing in this vehicle. Here's an example of how the income writer works. And these numbers are actually better. So this is a very average typical income writer. You put in a, a million bucks and let's say you take income the next year of 52,965. That's a 5.29% payout rate. Quite a bit better than two and a half. What if you don't need the money for 10 years? Well, you're guaranteed lifetime income at that point of 107,100 or 10.7% uh, drawdown rate if the market were flat for that 10 years, which is possible. We've seen 
Again, we've had two 13-year uh, periods with zero increases. Uh, this blue number here is just a bookkeeping number that they used to calculate uh, the payout. So it's this times that equals this. And these numbers are etched in stone in a legally enforceable written contract. So this is not a hope and luck strategy. So graphically, here's how a, a well-executed plan looks. So how do we manage step three? Well, the traditional portfolio management has been um, rebalancing. So let's say you have 10 funds. Uh, they go up or down. And they say, don't watch them, hang in there. For the long run, don't worry, the market always comes back. Well, that, that's workable when you're saving, it's not when you're spending. But, um, so let's say at the end of 30 days, five of the funds are up, five are down. We uh, sell some of the uh, increasing funds and buy some of the losers. So the problem is, what if these aren't done losing yet at the end of the month? And what if these aren't done gaining? So a technology driven, driven portfolio focuses on current trends and the rebalancing is chosen by the algorithm. It's not forced <clears throat> by a, necessarily by a time period. And it's okay to watch because we wanna be sure the algorithm is doing what it's supposed to do. And again, we have a long-term view, but we make adjustments based on current conditions. So at the end of the month, each fund is ranked. Uh, for the next month, the winners are chosen to invest in, the losers are put in the corner for a timeout. And during the month, we still have a stop loss program um, or fail safe or buffer on all of the funds. And then we do the same thing again. So I hope you have that memorized. Actually, you'll never need to know that. So in a simple graphic, here is the planning process. Uh, we do a, oops, sorry, retirement income project, uh, projection, income tax analysis. Uh, and if we do these two jobs correctly, you're gonna have uh, assets to leave behind. And we put all of this in writing. Uh, in a way that's easily accessible by you. So here's Bob and Carol, both 65, uh, retired. Quite a bit of assets they don't need yet. Uh, they've already filed for Social Security, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. But they have some worries. They've had a broker for 22 years, but they've never had a written plan and they would like one. So here's how they sit currently. They have um, these three accounts, stocks, uh, mutual funds, and the variable annuity all managed by the current broker. These are the annual fees. Uh, the money in the bank, of course, has no fees. So their total weighted average fee is 3% or $49,000. Now 3%, 3% doesn't sound bad, but when you uh, put out the uh, dollar amount, that's quite a bit of money for management. Here is their risk portfolio, risk profile, I mean. So if the market drops 53% like it did in 2008, their stocks will be worth half. 
mutual funds worth half, whoops, and the variable annuity worth half. And the cash, of course, won't decline unless they need to drop down to meet their budget. So on average, they're down by 49%. They need a 97% return to recover. Here is the revised plan for them. Uh, Bob's gonna continue managing the stocks. So, and we'll help out with that, with some tools, zero fees. Uh, we have the guaranteed income bucket, uh, the income rider fees in this case are 0.95%. Uh, and you're actually getting tremendous value for that. Uh, the liquid bucket, we're going to boost the cash up to 100,000. Uh, no fees. And then a growth bucket with 10% stop loss built in um, with fees of 1.9%. Uh, my typical fee is actually 0.75 these days. So the fee has been reduced from 49,000 to 17,150, and it's a much better plan. So they meet the golden rule of 100, barely. Uh, if we have a 53% 50, loss, they only lose 9.4. So a gain of 10.3 is needed to recover, which is doable. What about taxes? So their total gross income is 138,000. 129 of that is taxable uh, because part of the social security is not taxed. So total uh, income 129.9, their standard deduction would actually be 28,000. Uh, yeah, over 28,000 because they're both over 65, but we'll just go through this. So we have their taxable income down from 138 to 105.900. Federal and state taxes, 20,267. So as a percent of their gross income, uh, and that's a fairly high income for retirees, 138,000. Their effective rate is 15%. So we've designed, uh, we've designed a cash flow program to deliver 11,500 a month, minus 15% for taxes. So their net spendable income will be 9811. Their budget is 75, so that leaves 2311 for excess spending, saving, uh, gifting. Uh, so a tremendous amount of freedom. And as you'll see by the very last slide, it's that choice that matters. We want you to have choice. So how do we do that? How do we deliver that income? Well, here's Carol's pension. Uh, their social security benefits, a uh, managed IRA and a stop loss program. So they're getting their pension and social security and we're taking 60,000 a year out of the IRAs, out of her IRA. So total income, 130,000. Then at 70, the uh, two uh, income annuities kick in, 28,000 a year. We slow down withdrawals from the IRA and it actually starts growing again, as we'll see. So their gross income at that point is 150,107. And if we look at their assets, 1.6 million, that's at least a 9% spend down rate. Guaranteed for life. So now they have estate tax issues. We solve one problem and create another. Uh, they're only going to be passing assets to their beneficiaries. What's the best way to do that? So they were taking annual income from assets. 
That's their cumulative income. And this includes the uh, annuity income, by the way. So at, uh, let's say, five, their gross estate is three million. If most of that is in retirement accounts, it doesn't matter that they are under the <clears throat> you know, current 11,700,000 estate tax exemption. Uh, they'll owe Oregon tax on a million and the kids or their estate will owe Oregon tax on a million and the kids will owe ordinary income tax on the retirement accounts. Not the best way to pass on uh, assets. You know, that's a whole nother class or part of your plan. So understanding is a way of getting uh, a feeling of security, understanding your money, believing it'll behave the way you want it to behave. Here's the process. Um, introductory meeting, plan presentation, and plan implementation. Uh, four steps inside there are the retirement income, the taxes, uh, beneficiary analysis, and the written plan. All these need to occur before you do anything. So I don't double or triple dip my clients. You either pay an advisory fee, an asset management fee, or I get third party commissions from insurance companies. And that's my preference because I would rather not have my pay come out of your assets. So here are the seven commandments again. Um, I think I've showed you how and why to achieve these. So you're at a crossroads. Uh, you keep doing the same thing, keep risking, worrying, uh, <clears throat> not spending as much as you actually are able to. Or get a second opinion. Just see if there's something better out there. See if you can take control. So again, typically we can help people with one to 20 million assets. Uh, current minimum is 450. So sit down one-on-one -on -one, uh, or meet with you virtually, depending on what the governor says uh, in that particular day. Ask what you want to happen. Meet as many times as needed. Design an actual plan for you. Create a plan that reduces risk, lifetime income, and gives you a sense of financial freedom and never make you feel obligated. <clears throat> 